Praise God. Let's clap and magnify the Lord together. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. I've been very privileged to be a part of Apostolic Conference for several years, and most of those years, we uh, were not only a speaker, but also we came uh, having planted a church in San Francisco. And uh, I can not tell you the many times, of course, that we left here receiving much more, much, much more than we were ever able to contribute. And to that, I say a special thank you to Brother Dillon, Sister Dillon, Parkway Church. These are some of the kindest, most gracious people on the face of the earth. I want them to know that. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. And, uh, you know, it's kind of evolved around. I, I used to be a day speaker till the two other guys got so long there was no place for me. So I got bumped to Friday night. When they hand you the pulpit at 15 to 1 and you're supposed to be done at 1, there's not much time left. <laughs> anyway, but uh, I, I do appreciate this meeting, what it means, and thankful for a place that we can come and uh, just be apostolic. Just be apostolic, amen. And, uh, of course, it's just always a delight. You know, I just, Friday night, you always kind of hate it because it's about to end. I kind of feel like, you know, Peter, let's just build some tabernacles and stay here. But I don't think that's going to work. Poor old Peter, he didn't even know he was the tabernacle. Anyway, so God bless you, amen, of course. Glad to have John Mark. John Mark's come about every year. Sister Morgan, people say, why don't Sister Morgan travel with you much? She is the pastor <laughs> of abounding grace. She really is. And uh, matter of fact, Brother Tenney seen me here a while back, and he said, Brother Mark, I'm going to tell you what I used to tell Brother Cole. For God's sake, don't go home and mess your wife's church up. <laughs> Amen. So, man, a lot of friends and also. Uh, Ezra chapter 9, verse number 8. Ezra chapter 9. While you're turning, I, w I wanted to preach something tonight. I, I really wanted to preach it. Uh, but the Holy Ghost wouldn't let me, so. But I, I just want to tell you something. A few weeks ago, God dealt me very strongly about mountains. I don't have time to go into it, but I've dreamed about a mountain for years, climbing this mountain, and, and it's been quite an ordeal. But <clears throat> I went to San Francisco because of a vision about a mountain. And so, but, you know, a few months ago, God begin to deal with me, you need to learn how to discern the mountain. Because most of the mountains that come in our life, we want to cast them into the sea. But some mountains are not meant to be cast into the sea. Some mountains are meant to climb. And you can stand there and rebuke it and rebuke it, but if it's the mountain that Moses went up, God was at the top of it calling Moses, come on up here. And you may be rebuking something trying to cast God into the sea. We all want faith enough to be able to say, I cast my mountain into the sea. Some mountains, God says, no, you're going to climb this mountain. But trust me, when you get to the top, It'd be well worth the view. So whatever that mountain is, either cast it if that's what it's supposed to be or climb it. Amen. But we're coming close to something in the spirit. Ezra 9 and 8, now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God 
to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in this holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. And now for a little space. And now for a little space. I want to talk to you about that little space. That'd be all right? Come on, man. A little space. Amen. Father, I take into this service tonight, I take authority and dominion. I ask you to help me to say exactly what I'm to say, nothing more, nothing less. I pray for strength, spiritual, emotional, physical. I ask it in the name of Jesus. You're going to speak to us. and There is a prophetic anointing in this place tonight. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and everybody said, amen. amen. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. I give honor to Brother Tipton, our superintendent. Amen. Uh, last October, I was sitting out on our balcony. Now, I know some of you, when you think balcony, you think of some, but our balcony probably is about the space over there where those people are sitting. It's a big balcony, isn't it? That balcony cost me over $4,000 a month. Welcome to San Francisco. <laughs> I'm glad for it. Thankful for it. And, uh, <clears throat> but I was sitting there and just praying. And kind of just the way I do it. And it's just the Holy Ghost come upon me so strong. And I began to just weep. And I felt the Lord deal with me about this text of Scripture. I've preached from it another sermon years ago, but he began to deal with me about this text of Scripture. And I, um, I, I began to look at it again. But sitting there, this is something that I felt like he dealt with me about, spoke very strongly to me. I am going to give America a little space of grace. <clears throat> Donald Trump will be your next president. I'm not here tonight to get into politics. <clears throat> Whether you voted for him or you didn't, that's your business. But I knew in that balcony that Donald Trump would be the next president. What I felt very strong was, just as I raised up Cyrus, a heathen king, I can raise up another leader. I don't say that because Donald Trump is a righteous man. Cyrus was not a righteous man. But he did give favor to the people of God. And he is the one that made the decree to send <clears throat> Nehemiah and them back to start the rebuilding of the city, the temple. I don't have the time tonight to go into all the, the history of it, but I love to study the time of restoration. I really do. I, I like reading it. I, I see a lot of things in it in the spirit. Uh, what intrigues me the most about it all is God seems to have the right man at the right place at the right time. I mean, you got some you got some leaders in there: Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, uh, Ezra, Malachi, Haggai, Zechariah. Uh, the, these people. And each of these, God gave a special gifting and anointing to, to deal with specific and certain things that would come. Some had to deal with fear. There's three things that you'll find that tried to happen to stop the rebuilding or to stop it. Number one was fear. That's the first thing the enemy tried to use was fear. We're going to come in and kill every one of you. And, of course, the reply back to them was, no, we're not going to stop. We're, we're, we're not stopping this. And so uh, they, they dealt with this. Sad battle and Tobiah. We'll kill every one of you. We'll kill you. We'll kill your kids. 
And, um, you know, he tried to intimidate some people, and that's usually the first thing the enemy tries to do is strike fear in your heart that, uh, you know, I'm going to come in and do this and so. And, you know, so <clears throat> the next thing that happened is fear didn't work, so the finances got cut off. Cyrus had made a decree, not only am I going to send you people back, but I'm going to give you all the financing that you need to do this. Of course, people there didn't like it. They didn't want it to happen, so they bribed some high-ranking court officials in his court, and they stopped the finances from flowing. And, uh, you know, so they laid the foundation to the temple. That was as far as they got. <clears throat> I think Brother Wright was talking about that. It is true. Jesus even said, what good is it to lay a foundation if you don't have sufficient to finish it? If you just lay a foundation and you don't finish it, people are going to mock you. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? So God never intended for us to just keep shouting about a foundation. <clears throat> oh, boy. <laughs> I closed the revival one time. I, I need to be careful. They may be here tonight. I don't know. <clears throat> I closed the revival one time because everybody there, I mean, they, you know, we want a revival. When you tell me you want a revival, okay, we're going, let's have a revival. But, you know, I'm not just coming in to preach. I'm, we're going to have a revival. And so <clears throat> I went there, and everybody there, uh, all they want to do is come up and tell me. I prayed through back in 19-something on the verbal beam. And there's nobody in this building that has any more respect for the memory of verbal beam than I do. Matter of fact, his granddaughter's here tonight. But the fact is, is that's all they wanted to talk about. In the, when Verbal Bean was here in our revival, when Verbal Bean was here. And so that Sunday morning, I didn't even tell the pastor. Now, this is not how you're supposed to evangelize. I didn't even tell the pastor. I just got up and said, this is my last service. They'd scheduled me for weeks. I said, this is my last service. I said, I refuse to preach in a church that all you want to do is just shout about a foundation. I said, I'm glad for all the stuff that happened back in 1960-something, 1970-something, but you ain't done nothing since then. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we, we have the foundation there. The foundation's already laid. But 14 years later, Haggai the prophet had to speak to the people of God and say, well, you live in your sealed houses. The house of the Lord lies in waste. But you say it's not time. See, you keep waiting on that heathen king to send you some more money, and he ain't sending it to you. So you're still waiting for all the millionaires to come walking through the back door and finance this for you. Haggai said, I tell you what God wants. God said, why don't you go cut some timber yourself and just come down here and show him you're serious about doing this. That's what he was trying to talk about, Brother Shelton, a while ago about sowing. We sit here and wait for the, all the millionaires to show up, but God said, no, I want you to go cut some timber. You bring your offering down here and let me see what you're going to do, and I'll shake the heavens and the earth. All the gold is mine, and all the silk, boy, it locked up right there. All the gold is mine, and all the silver is mine, saith the Lord. And if we'll just show God we're serious about finishing what another generation started, I promise you the finances will start to flow and the blessings of God will come. And that's where we're headed with this thing. Well, some of you are looking at me really funny right now. And so that didn't work. And so, you know, so they, the finances. So here's what happened real quickly. Here's what. Who threw that up here? Oh. I, I think I lost my job, too. <laughs> I may after tonight, I don't know. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, so, you know, so they started back. They started building. And so what happened? They went and cut some timber. They come down. And here's what happened, Brother Dylan. The, the, those people there, Sam Bowen, Tobias, some others, they wrote a king. Now it's, it's Darius, Darius, he's king. And they wrote him a letter and said, those pesky Jews are at it again. They're trying to rebuild their temple. And he sends a letter down to Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, and he says, stop it. And they sent a letter back to him. Why do we have to stop? Your, your dad said we could do this. And he said, when did he say that? So well, it was by a royal decree. He said, where's the royal decree? Well, we don't know. And they finally found it in the summer palace. Hit. You really think the enemy wants the finances of God to flow into your church? 
I may not get any farther than this right here. <clears throat> Welcome to the world of Pentecostals. <laughs> Pentecostals. I've heard people say that. What religion are you? I'm Pentecostal. I'll get to it. So they, he, he said, we're, so he writes, he has, he calls for Ezra and says, actually call for Ezra, said, write this letter. And so he starts to write this letter and they sent it. And the letter said, whoever I find not honoring the decree of Cyrus, I'm going to tear your house down, hang you on the timbers of it and make it a dung heap. Now, the only thing I asked from those one God people is pray for the king and his sons. Now, you people get the finances down there, but it didn't start until they sold. Now, if you think that God's just going to bring it in without you sowing and showing him that you're serious. And there, I'm, listen to me. I'm not here to preach about money tonight. I never, but here we are. But the deal is, is we, we are deceiving ourselves if we think we're going to have a revival, an apostolic revival outside of sacrificial giving. There is no such thing. And I know everybody here is waiting on God to tell you to go down to the hospital and lay hands on somebody and raise them from the dead. It usually don't start there. It usually starts in a Pentecostal service where God says, that last $100 you've got in your pocket, give it. Mic check. One, two, three. Testing. Now, here's the deal. I really didn't lose my job, buddy. I'll just tease him. <laughs> Uh, here, here, here's the deal. So they, they started and, and they finished it and then now, but there's still not a lot of stuff as far as the Levites and the order of the house of God. They got it done. And so now here's where Ezra comes on the scene. Ezra comes on the scene and he's like, um, uh, we got a problem here. What's the problem? The problem is, is uh, I don't hear anybody doing anything here in the house of God. I don't hear this thing being finished. There's no ceremonial law being, oh, what, what's going on here? Well, the Levites and some of the princes, they've married strange wives. <laughs> that's what the Bible calls it. I'm not, you know, some of you say, well, I married one too, but I mean, <laughs> that's not, <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. Somebody outside the covenant, amen. <laughs> Call them strange wives. So they say, well, we married strange wives, and so... So Ezra calls for a solemn assembly, and he says, what's wrong with you people? Don't you know what got us in trouble to start with? When Solomon started marrying all these women, they started bringing their gods, and they started bringing their pagan practices, and this is exactly what happens, and that's why, we're, that's why we went into 70 years of captivity. I'm trying to hurry. We went into 70 years of captivity. Now, the deal is, uh, he calls them, he says, and now for a little space, grace has been shown. God didn't have to do this for us. We got ourselves in trouble. But God's given us a space of grace. Now, why in the world would you end this space of grace? Why would you want to revert back to the very thing that started you down the slippery slope anyhow? It's crazy. So he said, now, we need to understand God did this to leave a nail in his holy place and all this. But in that term, little space, little space. Uh, the Hebrew would lend toward this. It's like the winking of an eye. It's, it's, it's not a longevity. It's, it's just a little span. Just, just a little span. So what he's saying is God's just given us this little span for us to fulfill his purpose. He told us 70 years in the land of captivity and then we're coming back and this is what's going to happen. So this space of grace is about us fulfilling what was prophesied and us fulfilling the purpose of God. Now if we're not going to do it, we're in trouble. That's the only reason why God has, I'm telling you, I feel a very strong prophetic anointing on me right now. This, he said, that's the only reason God has given you this space of grace. 
Now, I want, I want, to, I want you to remember that because I'm going to tell you a story. I'm not here to impress you with people I know or don't know and all. Some of that stuff gets old to me after a while. But it just, I was not that close to Tom Barnes. Toward the end of his life, he took an interest in me and, and it was some wonderful experiences that I had and some great things that happened. But I, I was invited to come. Matter of fact, you were there. It's when you men were holding that young minister's deal there, Brother Barnes. And so it's the first time I'd ever really been around Brother Barnes or his church. And so he, he, wanted, to, he wanted to talk. So he said, I want, you, I want you to come over before the session in the morning. So it was about 7 o'clock. And I'm thinking in the morning, I'm like, oh my God, Brother Barnes, I'm on California time. It's 5 o'clock in California. I know all you guys that pray early in the morning. I'm telling you, man, I don't know if the Lord's even up at 5 o'clock in the morning sometimes. <laughs> And that's all I'm going to say, or I'll be in the morning at 5 o'clock. I'll be waking up like God said, I'm here. You want to talk? And I'm kind of like, can you come back later? Somebody that needs to take the evening shift. I volunteer for the evening shift here. I'm being careful. And so... Uh, so I went over and met with him, and I was I was just shocked. I was shocked by the whole scenario. I mean, I was I was you know, man, this is the world famous Tom Barnes. I went in that office, and I was like, my God, man, this is the drabbest office I've ever been in my life. <laughs> it's just panel, you know. I mean, those of you who've been in there, and and he had an old desk over there, kind of up against the corner, and had that little wooden rocking chair. And, He'd be rocking back and forth and, and, and on. Sit down, boy. And I sit down on this couch. When I sit down, I mean, it just sunk way down in the middle. I almost had to have a crane just to get off that couch. And I was sitting there, and, and he said, I want to talk to you, boy. And I was just like, okay. And he just starts what I thought was rambling. He's talking about America. I'm sorry, not a Canadian here tonight. <laughs> and he just starts talking about America. And uh, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is the world famous Tom Barnes. I'm in this office. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. And you want to talk about America? You've got to be kidding me. And so he gets talking about America. And, and he kept saying this. She's the new kid on the block. I, I, I'll never forget, oh, he, she's a new kid on the block. Finally, he said, you know, America's only 200-something years old. We're the sole world superpower at that time. And said, you know, other nations have been in existence for thousands of years. And I'm just like, okay, you know, all right. Seriously, that's, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking, okay, you know, all right, you know. I, that's not what I was expecting. And he said, you ever think about this? Now, I'm going to tell you, you can lie to a lot of preachers, but not a prophet. <laughs> yeah, Brother Barnes, I wake up every morning at 7 o'clock thinking about America. <laughs> Good morning, America. <laughs> so, I said, well, no, sir, I said... No. <laughs> well, you should. I should. It's got a lot to do with you and your generation. He said, what do you mean? He said, do you even know why America exists? I said, you know, it's one of those questions. You don't have the answer. They've already got the answer, so don't even attempt to answer the question. <laughs> No, sir. Yeah, thou knowest. No, sir, I, I probably don't. Well, you should. <laughs> he said, America exists for three reasons. 1967, he said, I was going through the trial of my life. He said, it was dark days. He said, every day I'd drag myself to the mirror and I'd look in the mirror. 
And I would say these words, Tom Barnes, you're going to live and not die. And you're going to do a greater work for God than you've ever done. And he said, Jesus, come to me. Jesus, come to me. So he appeared and said, Tom Barnes, I've raised you up to intercede for the nation of Israel. And then he said, he spoke to me and told me the three reasons that America exists. He said, now, he didn't say anything about my problem. He didn't say anything about my trial. He just said, this is what I've raised you up to do, and he left. He said, but I can tell you the moment I started doing what he called me to do is the day I started coming out of that All darkness. Right. Hmm. Yes. Three reasons that America exists. He said, number one, finance world missions. Finance world missions. You talked about, uh, where's Brother Shelton? You talked about time to sow. God didn't bless America for us to waste it and squander it, spend it on ourselves. I've raised you up as a nation to finance world missions. I'm thankful that in the last few years that general conference the spirit of giving has come and our missionaries are now being sent back quicker faster it's the will of god i said it's the will of god i said it's the will of god it's the will of god for local churches to finance everything they need to do I want to say that again. It's the will of God for local churches to say that man has a burden and a mission and we're going to finance the whole thing. It's a book of Acts thing and we're going to get to it. We're going to see it happen. We're going to see it happen. We're going to see it happen. I am convinced that there will be an unprecedented spirit of giving that sweeps into the apostolic church of North America. I am convinced that we're already entering into it. Are you hearing me here tonight? I am convinced as much as I'm standing here holding this microphone right now that when this begins and as it begins to continue, there'll be unprecedented finances that begin to flow into our churches because we got heathen kings and heathen people out here that God said, I'll move on them when I see you cut your timber and bring it to the house of God and sow it like you're supposed to sow it. I'll give you the hidden treasures of darkness. I'm not speaking that just to inspire you. I'm telling you that I believe that. If you cut me, I believe that right now. The second thing he said is God has raised up America to befriend and to protect Israel. Now, I'm telling you, when America was trending a few months ago toward becoming more anti-Israel, I was starting to get a little nervous. Are you listening to me? I said, I was starting to get a little nervous. Because I'm going to tell you about Israel. I'm going to tell you about that land over there. It's about a covenant that God made with them, an everlasting covenant. And he told Abraham, I'm going to give you this territory right here. And all that fighting and all that stuff to drive them out is about trying to make God a liar. Are you listening to me? I said, it's trying to make God a liar that he doesn't keep his word. But God said, Abraham, here's the boundaries of it. See that? See that? There and there? That belongs to you. It's an everlasting covenant. And I'm going to give it to you and your seed. That's how come they want to take it. That's how come they want to drive it away. But I got news for you. God's going to let them go so far. And he's going to say, I'm coming back to fight. You're going to remember this little battle because that I gave to them. And it's a covenant that I don't intend. Matter of fact, I took an oath at that place. I cannot lie. Let me tell you something God dealt with me about the other day. I thought, you know, okay. God said, you know, you need to understand something. Here's why I cannot lie, because I'm eternal. I said, you don't have to explain that one to me. He said, eternal means I fill all space at all time. 
He said, I live in an ever-present now. He said, that means there is absolutely no place nor time for me to change. So whatever God was, he still is. There is no shadow of turning in him. There's no variableness in him. If he's a healer, he's still a healer. If he was a way maker, he's still a way maker. If he was truth, he's still truth. If he's holiness, he's still holy. Are you listening? There's no place for him to change. There is no time for him to change. Praise God. Why in the world do you think he told him, stand still? Get out of your world and come into mine. I don't change. Get over here. You're too busy trying to work it all out. Get over here. Why do you think the New Testament says, stand? Just stand. Get in that and stand. The fact that God's eternal and he cannot change. So God told you something. He doesn't lie. He didn't change his mind. Now, you may think he changes his mind, but he doesn't change his mind. Or he doesn't change the fact of what he's declared. You with me here? All right. Now, let's, let's, let's get on. Here's, here's where we're going. We're going to protect and befriend Israel. Okay. Third thing he said is, God's raised up America to give it a military power that is strong enough to stop men and nations that are full of the Antichrist before his time. I said, okay. Now, I want to tell you what he concluded with before I go back to that one. He said, anything that will not fulfill its creative purpose has absolutely no reason to exist. He said, it doesn't matter if it's a man, a family, a ministry, or an organization, or a nation. It doesn't matter if it will not fulfill what's created, created to do for purpose. It has no reason to exist. So if you're still here, that means God's got a purpose. If you're still existing, that means God's still got a purpose. <clears throat> so, now, I want to say this, and I want to be careful, because I, I said it here a while back somewhere else, and I was informed I offended some people. <laughs> I never met anybody that's going through the tribulation. They think they're going through it that's got any joy. <laughs> I mean, what you got to look forward to? Your head cut off? Boy, it's quiet out there right now. I just, you know, I said, okay, I want to ask, I want to go back and ask you a question. You said that God's raised up America and given it a military power to stop men and nations that are full of the Antichrist before his time. That's exactly right. I said, then I want to ask you this question. Don't you think that before the physical collapses, the spiritual would have to be removed? <laughs> because the physical mirrors the spiritual. He said, absolutely. I said, okay. Then my second question is, that means that before America totally collapses as we know it, Something's got to be taken out of this earth. Because what America does in the physical, something else does in the spiritual. <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you. He said, that's exactly right. He said, you know what that means? I said, I, I think I do. Now, here's the deal. When Donald Trump got voted in, the chaos that hit this nation and the world. And you say, it's just a personality thing. Absolutely not. Let me tell you what happened. The spirit of the Antichrist knew it's here. Because everything else was pretty well a globalist. And the spirit of the Antichrist thought, the time is here. And God said, no, no. I'm going to give them a little 
space. And the reason for that little space is to fulfill my purpose. Now, if you don't want to fulfill God's purpose, there's no reason for us to exist. If we don't want to finance world missions, and we don't want to befriend and protect Israel, and if we don't want to be in combat against the spirit of the Antichrist, then guess what? We have no reason to exist. And the churches that will not involve themselves in that arena will not survive in the end time. Now, now, I want you to listen. All this, and I, let, let, me, let me help you with something. You know, man, God spoke all that to you. Yeah, he spoke it to me the second week of October. And by the third week of October, all hell broke loose in my life. God, what in the world? Son, you are already engaged with the spirit of the Antichrist. He's at war with you now. Now, that's going to strike some of you a little strange, but a few years ago, Gwen Porsche in Lake Charles, Louisiana, come, she said, Brother Morgan, God gave me a, is either a dream or vision, and I seen a table, and at that table, at that table, I seen the Antichrist and his cabinet. She said, but his cabinet were like people that represented nations. And said, sitting across from him, I seen some preachers. And she named a couple of them. And she said, you were directly across from the Antichrist. And she said, the Antichrist was very smug. He was very confident. So they were very arrogant, full of pride. And said, the preachers that were there were perplexed, like they were confused and a little dazed. And she said, but all of a sudden, I seen the hand of God come out of heaven. And it stretched papers across that table. And I looked at those papers and I could see it was a military strategies and it was a way to war. And she said they began to read, the preachers began to read it. And when they did, I could see their heads coming up and a confidence began to come and faith began to fill them. She said, but the problem was there were some empty chairs where preachers should have been sitting. So there is a prepared table, but there are some empty chairs. Because we start talking about the Antichrist and all that stuff, that's where the spirit of fear comes in. Oh, my God, man, the Antichrist, this is it. I mean, this is the whole deal. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, my Lord. You know, it just, you know. And I said, okay, God, I, I appreciate you showing me all this. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you, you can read that verse over in Psalms 23 and 5, and I understand what we usually, but the fact is there's another translation that says this, that anytime two opposing sides are going to battle, they sit down at a table to discuss the terms of engagement. They're going to decide where the battle was to be fought, who got what when they surrendered, how all this stuff would be done. Study it in the Hebrew. It's there. And the fact is not just a reprieve from the battle. God brings your enemy to the same table and says, sit down. We're going to talk about how this battle is about to be fought. And I hear the Holy Ghost tonight calling us as the Apostolic Church of North America and the end time church. I hear him calling us. I'm prepared. I have a prepared table for you. And I've got some chairs that you need to feel right now. I'm going to give you a strategy and I'm going to give you a plan. I'm going to give you wisdom how to navigate through the end time. Now you can fight. Don't you listen to me? You can fight all the FIFO ministry you want to fight. But if God does not raise up some prophets and seers for this end time that can see where the enemy's about to strike and know what's about to happen and help guide this church because if the blind lead the blind, we're all headed to the ditch. It's not time for us to try to lead it out of our intellect and try to just treat it like it's a business. It's time for us to come to that table and ask the Holy Ghost, you've got to give us a plan. You've got to give us direction. You've got to give us wisdom and how to navigate against what we're up against. You really think you can go back and... well? I said, God, you, you're going to have to help me. You're going to have to help me. 
My God, why do people have visions like that where I either meet the devil or the Antichrist? I'd like to be like Brother Barnes. Jesus, can't you show up one time? <laughs> I don't want to be sitting across from the Antichrist. That's how I felt going into this. God, you got to be kidding me. I just want to be left alone. <laughs> That's about most of us. I want to be left alone. Let's just have a cold war. I just said I would beat your chest and <laughs> threaten each other. And here's where it gets fun. You ready? He said, I'm about to show you the two he's of the end time. I said, the two he's read Thessalonians. There's one he that's referred to as he that stops it. He that will not permit it. Then there's another he that's referred to. He is the son of perdition. And there's two he's in Thessalonians. One is the Holy Ghost, and the other is the Antichrist. I said, oh, okay. He said, you think this Antichrist stuff's new business? <laughs> no, John said in his, his, his epistle, already the spirit of the Antichrist doth work. <laughs> it's already at work. You know, let me tell you one of the things that's Antichrist, you ready for a study this this afternoon? You tell me uh, that there's no preaching against sin anymore, that you can just live for God and keep sinning. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. Some of you got a spirit of Antichrist in your church. Now, he ain't come with 666 to put in your forehead yet, but that's the spirit of the Antichrist. You can continue in sin. Okay, but here's the deal. So I said, okay, but watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. For the spirit of the Antichrist doth already work. But, watch it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's your two he's. You need a revelation on which one's greater. What I put in you is greater. That's why I got to get it out of here. It's greater than the spirit of the Antichrist. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. I, I'm, I'm starting to get this a little bit. He said, now I want to show you something else. Now, if you could put that verse I gave your sister up there, you, you can sit down a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching kind of slow, and I'm, I'm not in a hurry. I, I, I'm, 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 I don't mind telling you. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 7, watch this. But we have this treasure in where? Earth of us, you know what it means? Clay jar. You know anything about clay? Easily broken. And so Paul said, I want you to understand we have this treasure in this earthen vessel that the excellency may be of the power of God and not of us. Not you. Hot shot, not you. You cannot, as a clay vessel, take the pressure. Paul's trying to show you how fragile you are, how easily broken you are. I had to tell a young man the other day, he was ram, 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 you know, doing one of the little deals, and I said, somebody needs to remind you that people are still human. And I know in the great Pentecostal world, we have this great Pentecostal pretend that we all walk around like we are perfect. And we learn to create images. It's like the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. People get behind the curtain, they're like, whoa. <laughs> it's not what you portrayed yourself as. <laughs> I'm sorry, I may have offended some of you and don't even know who the Wizard of Oz is. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but we have this great Pentecost pretend, and that we're, we, we don't want people to realize we're human. We're frail.
careful, careful. I had a man walk up the other night at church and he said, I don't get some of this stuff you've been talking about here lately. I'm 70 years old almost and I've never had problems like you're talking about. He says, so if God's going to start, you better get busy. Oh, I knew right then. Sir, you just ask for trouble. I thought, you've got to be kidding me. So here's the deal. He understood this, but he said, the excellent may be a power of God and not of us. Now, what's this? We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Now, here's where Paul is a master. See, so you'll read over that, and you'll fail to realize what he just really said. Because when he said, we're troubled on every side, what he's telling you is the condition of the clay vessel. But when he says, not distressed, he's telling you about the treasure. So what he's saying is, is the clay vessel may be troubled. But trust me, that treasure in you, it's not distressed. Yeah. Yeah. Per perplexed? Did you come perplexed? You may be perplexed, but that, that treasure in you, it's not, where's it at? It's not in despair. Persecuted, that's the clay vessel. But that in you is not forsaken. You may be cast down, but that treasure in you, it's not destroyed. How do you destroy the Holy Ghost? How do you destroy God? You're going to have to learn how to let the treasure in you do what it was created to do. They've been pounding this on you all week. I said, they've been pounding this. He said, okay, son, now you need to learn how to destroy the Antichrist in your life just like I'm going to destroy him. Well, how's that? He said, read Thessalonians some more. So I read down through this. said, and by the spirit of his mouth and by the brightness of his glory. And he said, now, don't misunderstand what it means by the spirit of his mouth. That don't mean you just learn to quote some scripture. I've heard the devil quote scripture. I was casting the devil out of a man one time, and he was quoting scriptures. I was casting the devil out of him. Yeah, he was. <clears throat> he knows the word. He said, it's the spirit of your mouth. He said, that's more than just you quoting some scripture. I said, okay, God, help me. He said, I gave you a treasure. I put something in you to help you. I put something in you that's greater than the pressure that you feel. You're going to have to learn how to let it work. It's been quoted a hundred times this week. I'm going to quote it one more time. For likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. You cannot pray with any more power or any more authority. And I'm not talking about the dainty tongue of edification that you've learned. I'm not talking about you getting in prayer and rattling off those few little words that you've, whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. That's a tongue of edification. That just kind of helps you build you up a little bit. I'm talking about where that's something in you that says, I'm the treasure that God gave you, and that clay vessel of yours cannot take what it's going through if you don't let me do what I'm supposed to do. And, brother, all of a sudden, when you get into that dimension, the Holy Ghost said, I just need to borrow your vocal cords. Why don't you get out of the way? I can pray the perfect prayer. I can pray with perfect righteousness. I pray with perfect faith. You can't do that. You don't even know what you're fighting sometimes. You're about to crack up. You're about to lose your mind. You are so perplexed. Why don't you learn how to let what I put in you? Come on, Pentecostals. It's more than just a little jibber-jabbering tongues. God said, I'm going to leave that here until it's time for him to take over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ekasha Tomaka Yasha. I, I told you, since October, all hell, but I won't tell you the other side of that. I have never, ever in my life, and I've had some pretty powerful prayer meetings, ever moved so easily and so quickly into that. I mean, it just like it hits. It's just like, boom, there it is. I'm telling you, the other day, I, I, you know, Sister Schnault, bless her heart, she, I, I asked her one time, I said, where did you learn how to pray? 
Uh, she, I don't want to tell you. I just, that's personal. No, tell me. She told me about how her and Brother Schnault, they first got married living way out in the country, and she got lonely for fellowship. She's washing the dishes. Everybody's at work, and she's out there by herself, and she's washing dishes with that hand pump. She said, I just said, Jesus, can't you send me some company? I just get lonely out here by myself. <clears throat> said, in a few minutes, I heard the screen door open. Said, I heard footsteps coming down the Lillium hallway. She said, I, I really want to know him this way. I really do. She said, I turned to greet Brother Chenault. But Brother Chenault wasn't there. Said, the footsteps kept coming into the kitchen. She said, I watched the kitchen chair pull away from the table, and I watched the cushions and dent, and I watched the chair pull back to the table, and I heard the audible voice of Jesus say, I get lonely to talk to people too. <laughs> Sit down. Let's talk. She said, for three hours, Jesus and I sat at that kitchen table, and she said, Brother Morgan, she said, every day since, my friend comes at the same time. She said, I just talked to my friend. See, that's what he wants to be to all of us. I want to help you. What it, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth, helpeth the very help that God's trying to give you. You push it away. You squelch it down. You push it aside. That's a little extreme. It's fanatical. No, it's not. It is the power of God in you. It is the excellency of His power. And it says, let me do what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I mean, I can just walk in the office, just walk in the office. I'm telling you, despair, dark, just walk in the office, sit down in the chair and just try to carry on a conversation. And then all of a sudden, there's tears just, I come, my God, I didn't know I had so much tears, tears. And then just this, this tongue, it just, it just comes out and it's just, it's just there. The other night I was at the office and it was kind of semi-dark in there. And, and I, I, I said, okay, if you did it for Marilyn, you'll do it for me. And I told him, I'm sorry, guys, I have a confession. I pulled, I sat in the chair there at the conference table and I pulled one of those chairs around in front of me. And I said, I need you just to sit here and let me talk to you. And I felt him. And here's what I told him. I know I'm supposed to have a lot of faith. I know that. I know I'm supposed to be courageous. I know that. I know I'm supposed to be confessing all this stuff. I know that. But I need to tell you, I'm afraid. I'm fearful. I don't know what's about to happen. I just need you to help me. I'm not asking you to put this mountain in the sea. I'm just asking you to give me the grace to climb to the top. That's all I'm asking. Just, I need some help here. I just need a little help here. And it wasn't just explosive, but here it come. It's just like something in my spirit just, oh, here it come and just, Next thing I knew, I just had my head back and I felt the peace of God. It didn't, he didn't take me out of the stress. He didn't take me out of the stuff, but just felt the peace of God. There it was. There it was. Now, hang on. Hang on. I need to finish something. There it was. It just, I know we, we, we think we have to be superhumans. I know we have to put on this great image and pretend sometimes when that clay vessel is under so much pressure, you think, I'm about to crack up. Now, I know some of you don't have any idea. I realize you live in a world I don't live in. But I'm telling you, I have, I've, said, I've seen the Antichrist. I've met him. 
I've had him come in there. I know you want to talk about the spirit of the Antichrist coming to San Francisco. And I don't need none of your stupid jokes. I get sick of hearing it. You know, just stupid stuff. You know, like they don't even have souls. People there don't even have souls. I don't care what you're bound by. Prejudice can be more than a skin color. Hello? Just, we, we fight it there. We fight it. It's all through Europe. It's all through Europe right now. No doubt you fight it. It's, it's just it's so anti, just anything Christ, because anti-Christ, anti-against, opposing Christ, Christos, anointed one. Watch me, anointed one, anointed ones, anointed flesh. Isn't it amazing the book of Acts is the acts of the anointed ones? So it's not just that it's anti-Jesus Christ. It's anti-anything that's anointed flesh. And you're his target. He wants to wear you out in your mind. Read the book of Daniel. He wants to wear you out in your mind. Whoo. But that's something in you, says. I want to help you. Let me go. I want to help you. Now, don't you listen. Here's what I feel to close with tonight. <clears throat> Some of you come and you've, you've been already so inspired, helped so much. But here's the deal. It's about nations now. It's about nations. And there are, it's about cities. And there are things on the other side of the table. They have a plan. They have a strategy. But at this meeting, the Holy Ghost said, I prepared a table. They're going to go back and they're going to set a cross from these opposing spirits. I want you to remind them of what they've heard already. Greater is he that is in you. And I'm not going to leave you without a strategy. You're not going to read it in a book. You're not going to go to a growth meeting. You're not going to learn. I told somebody the other day, I said, first of all, you need to learn the difference between retention and discipleship. You can go learn all kinds of things about retention. You can learn how to connect community and all that's good. And I, I mean, I've read all the books. That's what tickles me. Some of these guys go around like they come up with it. Oh, give me a break. You're not on the kidding edge of anything. You're just a clone. You copy stuff. You read it, and then you try to impress us that you got it by yourself. You didn't get it. These other guys got it. And, and I'm for it. We, we do all those things. But there is a difference between you learning how to retain people than in you discipling them. You can connect them to whatever you want to connect them to in your community of believers. But that does not mean they're being discipled. So, God's going to give you a plan. We are now entering into what I consider to be the last Gentile harvest. We're entering into it. That's what this space of grace is about. God is going to visit our nations and our cities again. He will turn his face toward us. He will. He's going to come to you. He's going to come to your city. He's going to come to your nation. He's going to come to your family. He's going to come to your church. We need to understand times of visitation. We need to prepare for it. The first thing you need to understand about preparing for a time of visitation is he told the temple of Jerusalem, he said, because you will not fulfill what I created you to fulfill, I'm going to destroy you. You're supposed to be a house of prayer. And our churches are known for preaching. They're known for our choirs. They're known for our lights. They're known for our club scenes and everything else. And I'm not an old man on a soapbox here. I'm just telling you the facts. But is your church a house of prayer? Are you a house of prayer? That's the first thing to prepare. If he's coming to his house, come to a house of prayer. We need to welcome him. He's coming into these nations. He's going to give us a plan for the end time on how to take nations. 
It's already started. It's also, and I won't go into this tonight, I will say one point from it. It started in the book of Acts, and it says, Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? If you think we can finish this thing in the flesh, and it was started in the Spirit, you've lost your mind. Mm. The other thing is, in that first revival there in Jerusalem, now please don't misunderstand me. I think everybody knows that I believe in the power of God and demonstration, miracle signs and wonders. I've given my life to it. But that was not the thing that got the attention of Jerusalem. It was when they seen those people loving each other. And they knew they're acting like him. And when we responded a while ago out of love, yes, sir. see the world don't understand that. They don't understand that kind of stuff. So it's not just miracle signs and wonders that's going to get the attention of your city. It's going to be when they see you acting like Jesus and loving like Jesus, which produces, which produces miracle signs and wonders. Some of you are only wanting those gifts to so just affirm your ministry. That's why you'll never get it. You're felling the third temptation. You want God to let you use the power of God to demonstrate to your enemies that you're who you say you are. Are you listening to me here? I'm going to tell you when the gifts are going to operate, when we're going to walk into apostolic dimensions, when we start loving God's family and God's body and the world like we need to love it and covet the best gifts earnestly. And when I can look on you not, listen to me, listen to me. You think that the miracles are coming through faith or not coming through faith. They're coming through compassion. More miracles happen when the Bible says, and Jesus was moved with compassion. Boy, I just lost about 70% of you right there. Compassion. When you look on the needs of that person and you're moved with compassion and you realize I don't have anything to give you that's going to help you, but such as I have... You want miracles to start happening? Start loving like you ought to love. Get connected back to Jesus and start loving like you ought to love. And I'll say one more thing about that. Don't tell me you love the loss and treat God's people like they're a bunch of trash. You can't decide which to love and not to love. I love the loss, but I don't love God's people. Don't work that away. And I'll tell you something else. If you say you love the body but you don't love sinners, you're badly mistaken too. Now I'm, I'm saying stuff I shouldn't say. This is where it's going to happen. Last few months I have been deeply moved by one thing. The love of God's people. Just the love. Just the kindness, just, just, you know, because we're supposed to be all strong. And all of a sudden, you, you know, you're not the strong one now. You're in need of something. And then you watch God's people, people that you, you know, and all of a sudden it's just like, God's showing you something here. It's here. It's here right now. You, it's going to happen. Just get ready. So, here we are. And this is what it says. And great grace was upon them all. So when God showed that to me, he said great, what it meant, grace is charism, it means a gift. So it really is almost, I don't know what we say, but it's, it can even include that great gifting was upon them. And here's the deal, God says, I know that you're entering into this special space. But one of the things that I'm going to do in this space is I'm going to give things greatly. I'm going to give you, and sometimes it irritates me because it's like I need you and your generation to go anoint a double portion generation. They're going to finish this. They're going to finish this. I was watching you operate last night, Brother Herod. I was kind of mad a little bit. No, I don't mind telling you. I was like, 
God, that boy's up there doing all that. I fought hell to do that. Yes, sir. <laughs> See, we're going to have trouble with 11th hour workers. They're not going to have to pay and work as much as you did to get it. I, I'm messing with some of you right now, and I realize that. And I'm kind of looking at like they're coming. I'm like, my God, man, I fought the devil, the beast of Ephesus. Half the organization. And these guys just... You're a double portion generation. Let me tell you why. It's because of timing. It's because God says, I got to have my purpose fulfilled. Now, folks, I'm really, I'm trying to stop, but I, 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 I'm, that's, that's where you're at. That's, that's Brother Dylan's been telling you this, this, this meeting went, why? Because we've entered into this space. We've entered, we're not going, we're entering into it. And, and, and listen to me, in this space of grace, and, and Charles Shear told me, confirmed it today, I'm, well, who cares what you think? But we're going we're gonna to see some very unique, supernatural things happen. And one of those things is going to be, we're about to see an angelic visitation. And the only reason is, is for us to go the distance, just like Jesus. The angels of God are going to have to come and minister like they need to minister and to help like they need to help and do what they can do because we're all working on the same team. Are you listening? I'm not trying to make it mystical and spooky here tonight. I'm just telling you, this is where we're going. There's a uh, key of mine. There's about to be some supernatural things that happen that's going to blow people's minds. It, it's just, it's, it's, we're entering into it. It's, it's the season. It is the time. This is why all hell's been breaking loose. But at the same time, God's saying, I'm moving you and transitioning you into this period of time. We're about to see an apostolic restoration is what we're about to see. And I'm not convinced that everything and everybody is going the way of the flesh. I'm convinced that we're about to see demonstration and resources. I'm back to it again. Resources. Spiritual, emotional, physical, and financial resources are going to come into this season of grace here on an unprecedented manner. It started with that. It's got to end with that. You don't think that God strategically chose Peter, James, and John to start it? Do you think he just took it by chance? Well, let's see if I, what I can find down there now. Absolutely not. As strategic as he chose them, he's choosing people right now. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. I'm going to anoint you with this. I'm going to give you this. This is going to be imparted to you. You're going to operate in this. They're already in you. The gifts are already in there. They're already in there. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of the fullness of time to activate what God's already put in there no 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 just listen just listen hang on hang on hang on hang on hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. now I, I've waited to really know if I'm supposed to do this or not and I, I'm, I'm going I'm going I'm going to do it here's our battle I come out of the cotton fields of southeast Missouri. I got a cotton stalk I bought down at that Magnolia Farms place. Preserved cotton stalk. It's in my office. Put it on the shelf. And every once in a while, I'll just look at it. My dad was a cotton picker. My grandpa was a sharecropper. We were poor. We really were. We were poor people. God's been good to me. I look at my dad sometimes, and I know he's got a lot of mistakes, but he just did the best that he knew how to do. I won't tell you the first part of it. 
I, I was preaching for Brother Shatwell. And uh, I've, I've wrestled with just, God, you got to be kidding. Me? You got to be kidding me. Me. Yeah. So I was preaching for the chat when I was on the sanctuary praying on my again. I used to love to pray in that sanctuary. I was praying one day and the Holy Ghost spoke some things to me, Brother Wright. It was so far out there for me. You will do this, you will do this, and you will do this. And you remember in that day, Moses was not in the court of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was in my court. When you stand before them, you remember that. And I was sobbing. God, you've made a terrible mistake. So that's where your unbelief is. All of you believe God can raise the dead, heal the sick, but you just don't think he can do it through you. Because the enemy gets you on that clay vessel stuff. Gets you on the son of man side, works on you. You're not from the right lineage. You're not from this. You don't have this. You don't have this. You don't have this. And I said, God, I, I'm really trying to believe, but this is so far out there. As a sign to you, I will visit this area not many days hence with massive death and destruction. As a sign to you that this will come to pass, I will do this. So, okay. So I went to church that night, Brother Shatwell. I didn't tell him the first part. Very few people I told that. But I said, God said he's going to visit this area not many days hence. And I told him, and there was a man in his church at the time. He had a Bible, and I said, write it down, what I just said, and I'm going to date it and sign it. And it's, I guess, still in the front of that Bible if he's got it. How far are you from Oklahoma City? 70 miles. That was on a Monday night. I will visit this area not many, as a sign to you. I will visit this area not many days hence with massive death instruction. Next morning at 8-something, Timothy McVeigh backed that rented van up to the Murray Federal Building. Sent 150, 60 people into eternity. Now, you know, did God, no, 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 don't misread what I just said. God said, I'm going to let you in on something, and just as much as I'm letting you know that's going to happen, that will happen. Your biggest battle is your feelings of insignificance and all. And that's probably why God's going to use you like he's going to use you. Because the excellency will be of the power of God and not you. God started dealing with me. Some of you are wrestling with that. I just, well, you know, yeah, you, Brother Shatwell, Brother Wright, Brother Herod, Brother Woodbury, you guys, all, yeah, you guys up here on fire. Yeah, y'all can do it. You know, Brother, Brother Watts can go there and build, but, you know, I don't think God lied to you this week, do you? So God intends to send you back into a space of grace with unprecedented anointing and finances and resources and the blessing of God because he said, I called you to finish this thing and I'm depending on you to finish it. I want to bless you so you can finance world missions. I want to give to you so you can finance home missionaries. I want not, 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 not for any other reason. I want to do this for you. I heard this man last night talk about the kingdom. I'll never forget. I'll never forget the first time I heard it. A man walked up and said, I feel to tell you something. The Holy Ghost said, what? He said, God's going to raise up people in the end time, and they're called kingdom millionaires. They are millionaires only for the kingdom, and God's going to raise them up. Now, folks, I'm talking to some of you here right now. You may be so broke you can't even pay attention. I don't mean badly bent. I mean broke. And when I said that, you're like, well, how can I do that? I mean, how could that be? But I'm going to tell you something. It's not about you. It's about the fact that God says, I just need a conduit. I just need something that can flow through. I just need somebody to sit there and say, look what I did and get all greedy and clutchy. I need somebody to sit there and say, this is the blessing of God. And 
I'm going to finance a home missionary. I'm going to finance a home missionary. As a matter of fact, I'm going to finance them out of my church. I'm going to finance them to go to the next city. I'm going to finance them to go across town. You want God to start blessing your congregation? Take your hands off of it. Send them. If you don't send them, they may start persecution in your church. You can either be an Antioch church or you can be a Jerusalem church. The only way to get them out of Jerusalem is persecution. The way he got them out of Antioch is in a prayer meeting. And the same man that caused persecution in Jerusalem is the one they sent out of Antioch. He was Saul over there but became Paul. And if you don't let them go when God says go, they're going to start persecution in your church and you're not going to like what they're about to do. Sometimes it's easier to let go of money than it is to let go of people. My God, you can't ask for any two better than Paul and Barnabas. The best that Antioch had. God said, send them. And then they come. Oh, God, I've messed this service up so bad. How in the world? Listen to me. Listen. I cannot, with a good conscience, drive through the Bay Area. Eight million people. City after city after city that does not have a church. And me worry about the crowd I'm going to preach to on a Sunday afternoon. Because I'm afraid to send them.